Good afternoon, everyone. Really thrilled to welcome you today for our conversation with Jason Finger. We'll be getting started uh, with that conversation here in a few minutes, but before we do so, just want to welcome you and tell you a little bit about the NYU Law Venture Fund. And for that, if you're watching this on Zoom, I'll be sharing my screen for a few minutes here. Um, for those of you who don't know, the NYU Venture, uh, Law Venture Fund has been in existence for three years now, and our goal is to bring together our community, members of um, our community, including students, our alumni, um, to do a, a host of different things, to bring together entrepreneurs and investors around events such as this, uh, certainly a number of different programs, as well as funding opportunities. Um, and they're listed on the screen here, so I'm not going to read through all of them. I'll quickly mention one thing that's pertinent to students, which the deadline's actually tomorrow. We're hosting another business plan competition. This is open to all JD and LLM students. No prior entrepreneurship experience is required. Um, and in fact, you don't have to work on this company after the competition if you don't want to. We're really just trying to get you all to ideate and think through solutions to problems in um, either uh, the healthcare space, uh, thinking about justice tech, or the future of New York City. So uh, feel free to visit our website to be able to submit your ideas there. I uh, wanna quickly plug our next event, which is in a few weeks. We'll be welcoming Alex Elias. He's the founder and CEO of Clue. Um, and we'll be having a conversation with Alex in a few weeks. Uh, so please do sign up and join us for that. But with that, I'm really thrilled to welcome Jason Finger uh, to this conversation today. I've had the pleasure of working with Jason over a number of different years and very, very excited to have Jason with us. I'm not going to read your bio, Jason, because I know we're going to talk a bit about that, but I do want to just let the audience know a few things. Uh, and I think one of those is that, as you all probably know, Jason is a hugely successful entrepreneur, an angel investor, an advisor and a director. Uh, Jason invented the tech enabled food delivery category when he started Seamless a few years after law school. And then of course, throughout Jason's career as an investor and an entrepreneur, he's also invested in companies such as ZocDoc, Freshly, TaskRabbit, Betterment, Envision App. And Jason, I think I could take the whole hour if I went through your bio. So thank you for joining us. We're so thrilled to have you. And, um, Jason, maybe as a starting point, uh, can you tell the group a little bit more about who you are? Sure. Well, hi, everyone. And it's a huge honor for me to be here. I remember uh, being at law school. It feels like yesterday, although these days, I don't know really that even yesterday feels like yesterday, uh, what a long year it's been. Um, so I, uh, I moved to California uh, a few years ago. I live in Pacific Palisades. I have a wife and three kids. My kids are 17, 14, and six. So the last year has been quite interesting. Um, I primarily spend my time on in really kind of three areas. The first is I run a credit-focused fund. Um, we provide credit to companies that, that, that um, where we find a form of collateral that traditional lenders don't see collateral. Uh, that could be a data asset, that could be some sort of goodwill, marketplace uh, equity value, um, a litany of things that I'm happy to talk further about. Uh, but really it, it was born out of the idea that for the most part, when people read articles about building a business, the first thing that they see is how much company, uh, how much a founder A has raised, how much equity a founder B has raised, et cetera. And raising equity is sort of demonstrated as a, bad, a, a badge of honor. And the reality is, is that the most effective way to build a business often is to try to minimize dilution as much as possible and find alternative ways to finance the business. And so you see countless circumstances where founders and early teams own three, four, five percent, even after a company's been wildly successful, while the absolute dollars are incredibly uh, fantastic the actual relative value based upon the contribution that those individuals have made to building the business versus the later stage investors that came in where really they were just providing capital is, is very disproportionate. And so um, one of the things that I saw in the, many of the businesses that I was involved with was that founders were really thinking about financing their business 
only via equity and there are a whole litany of other ways to finance a business. And so using Seamless as, as an example, um, we launched the business uh, really March of 2000, the dot-com bubble had just burst. Um, we had 44 shareholders. Um, we raised $345,000. Um, my wife's grandfather was one of our larger investors. He put like $500 in, you know, it was really, if you looked at me, we were trying to raise money from you. And then the dot-com bubble burst. And what we found was that uh, one is the name of the company originally was Seamless Web. No one wanted to invest in a business that had the word web in its name. Um, uh, so that was one issue, but we also didn't really have access to be pocketed friends and family. And so, uh, so we knew that we needed to be very capital efficient. And so instead, as an example, instead of us going out and trying to sort of maximize the margin that we would earn on every food order that was placed, so if uh, someone placed a $20 order for food, I was less focused on whether we were going to make $1 or $2 from that purchase, but rather I was focused on, is there a way that we could keep the $20 from the food purchase and use that to help us grow our sales? So we really focused a lot more on working capital management and shifting the focus on what I'll call like the take rate or the margin that we earned on each order and focus more on the working capital of how long can we create separation between when we collected the money and when we needed to pay the restaurants. And so as a result, Seamless was able to grow with only about $2.4 million of equity that was raised. And so our team owned a meaningful percentage of the business relative to the outside investors. Whereas in most other companies that were launched around the same time, they were focused on trying to get the $1 that they would, they would retain for, to be $2 and they ended up raising a lot of money, getting massively diluted and or using that strategy, finding that they needed to be dependent upon the capital markets and the capital markets weren't there. And we were able to buy them on the cheap, so to speak. Um, so in any event, upper 90 is, is one of my activities. Um, I, also, uh, I also have a private equity fund that uh, is called the Finger Group. And it is essentially a smattering of minority and majority investments, um, where we look to be very founder friendly with our capital, um, really try to figure out ways that we can own as little as possible of the business. Um, I, I would say that I'm sort of what I would call long-term greedy versus short-term greedy. I'm a really big believer that good karma comes back in, in, you know, exponentially. And so really try to pay it forward and try to figure out ways and structures where a I can enable the founding team or the management team to own a lot more of their business than they otherwise would have uh, owned if they work with other folks. And, and just one quick part of that actually from my NYU experience was that um, I took uh, a tax class, income tax with Jerome Kurtz, who was the former head of the IRS. And for whatever reason, I really enjoyed the class. And so one of the things that I spend a lot of time on with my investing activities is getting to know the founders and what they're sort of sol solving for and taking a very tax focused approach to that. And so most, uh, most investors are really focused on their equity relative to the founders and what the value of the business is. And most founders are focused on securing the capital and not really thinking about what the after tax return to them if the business is successful would look like. And so things like, do you have trust set up? How have you structured some of these various tools that are out there? Are you making sure you're doing the appropriate filings? Is there a way to use your, your IRA or your Roth IRA? And so I sort of really focused on the idea of everyone's money is just as green as everyone else's. So what can you do to get your money to be a little bit greener? And for me, it's really been trying to take this founder-centric approach to help the founders be successful, own more of their business, not only relative to their investors, but also relative to the sort of broader IRS. Um, and, uh, and then I, I, have, I, I am involved in a number of businesses that I'm helping to incubate or what I'll call accelerate, where I find an entrepreneur and I'm really excited about working with him or her. And, uh, and I get more deeply involved than just sort of writing a passive check. So, uh, and then the three kids with Zoom is put all that, put all that together and it somehow is more than a full-time job. Totally, Jason. Uh, we, there's a lot to, to get to and we're thrilled that you take the time to do this today. So thank you. Just want to let the audience know that for free, we have a Q&A 
feature. I'm sure all of us are very familiar with Zoom at this point. So please, we wanted to make this as conversation, conversational as possible. So please do submit questions. Jason, one of the things we're gonna spend a good amount of time talking about this afternoon is about starting a startup um, at law school or after law school. A uh, majority of our attendees today are current students at NYU Law, although we do have a number of alums here with us as well. Um, but before we get to that topic, I just wanted to talk about two different things that you raised, and one is with Upper 90. It's clear that you've identified a pain point uh, from the perspective of an entrepreneur and, and the fact that in the usual capital raise, they eventually end up getting diluted in terms of their equity. Uh, curious to hear about your thoughts more broadly on the VC space going forward. Upper 90 has been recognized. There have been articles about the uniqueness of what you are doing. Um, maybe just a big picture. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on trends in the VC space? Do you, do you think that the, the, the shift is going to take place more broadly, et cetera? Sure. Uh, a, a lot to unpack there. And so I'll try to be sort of brief and, and, and I'll say, and I'm not, not in any way trying to sort of like tout my own book, but <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Upper 90 really was, was, was created with the idea that there are ways other than equity to finance your business. And, and um, this was at the time a more novel approach than you might think. And so we, we started out in two, the end of 2018. And what we would essentially do is we would provide a loan to a company. We might make a very small equity investment and we would get some warrants in the business. But as a company gained success, they could finance our credit out. So they didn't really kind of have a permanent partner in the business. And um, we, we ended up with a small $75 million fund, which is tiny in credit standards. Um, and through that, over the course of the past two year, two and a half years, we've now originated about $2 billion worth of deals. Um, and, and how do you do that with a $75 million fund? Well, you make a loan to a business and then hopefully the business is successful and you actually take an active role in trying to help the business to become successful through leveraging your network, leveraging your, your existing kind of stable of entrepreneurs that you've worked with, putting them in touch with the right joint venture partners, et cetera. And Upper 90 is all the LP base, the limited partner base, sort of our investors are all individuals themselves, no institutional investors. We made that decision very intentionally because we wanted to have maximum flexibility to create structures that would work for the companies. And often an institutional investor wants you to have sort of a specific way of doing something that's a rinse and repeat type model that they can underwrite once and they don't have to keep tabs of what the individual managers are doing. And so we, we chose to work with a, a, a variety of individual LPs because they're all adding value to the companies that we're involved with. So we have 300 people that are the founders of some of the household names, certainly in the New York technology ecosystem in San Francisco as well. Um, people that are working at very large financial services firms, my co-founder at, at Upper 90 used to work at a very large financial services firm running quant sales for them. And so his network is very uh, uh, um, robust in the financial services world. And so we've created this fund where we've got experts from finance and experts from business building for technology and emerging company business building. We take those together. And when we provide a loan to a company, we will really get sort of actively involved the way that a, a venture fund that you would want to have in your fund um, gets involved, except the ownership that we have is much less significant relative to what a, a venture fund would, would have. So anyway, I think that the reason that I share that context is because when we launched, I think that you don't go from 75 million to a little over 2 billion. Um, um, if you haven't tapped a, a, a vein in the opportunity set, and I think that that vein really is that a lot of businesses are now able to leverage, whether it's social media, Google, et cetera, very effectively, so that you know that a dollar into Facebook will create $8 of revenue and you have 60% margin. So basically, $1 creates $4.80 of value to the business. And if you can rinse and repeat that and you've got a high level of predictability, then equity becomes a really expensive form of financing. And so, so I say this because what's happening now is that as especially like in the consumer space or in a variety of other spaces where you get predictable metrics of 
a dollar out equals four dollars and eighty dollars four dollars eighty cents of contribution or you have a business where you have a direct sales force going to businesses and you've got some level of predictability in SaaS type revenue, there are really very effective ways that you can finance, the, finance a business. So, so my perspective is that I think in the very early stages of investing, seed type series A, there will continue to be a very robust network of funds. And I think that the funds are gonna really have to get even more deeply involved than they already do to demonstrate that they can add value. I think funds will likely take more concentrated bets instead of what I'll call like a spray and pray approach. But I think that in the mid to later stages of the, of the private equity chain, I think that those, those segments will be, begin to be quite challenged, especially given the proliferation of data, because now you can learn so much about a business um, through kind of what I'll call data exhaust. So we can go and speak with a company and we might often know more about the business than the founding team itself because of secondary sources of data, because of all these other ways that we can learn information. And so I think that, that those that are able to harness data will be really kind of the winners here. And those that are really able to add value on a kind of one-on-one -on -one hand to hand combat will also be the winners. But those that whose primary value is just financial engineering, I think will be in a much more challenged, uh, challenged state. And just one other thing along those lines is that there's also been sort of a proliferation of what I'll call venture studios. And I think that is also a movement that will continue to gain traction because what has happened now is that um, it's hard to find what I'll call product market fit in a business. But once someone does, the tools and the distribution platforms that enable that business to scale are quite are becoming more and more developed. And so you end up getting a business where there's only a brief period of time between product market fit and meaningful scale. And what ends up happening is that there's a mad rush from a variety of funds to try to invest and be involved in those businesses. And it becomes very challenging to get access to those companies. Whereas, so I think that there's gonna be more of partnerships between venture studios and venture funds so that the venture uh, funds have sort of a captive audience of prospective investments that will that will give them give them an opportunity to, to deploy capital and help the founders and, and teams build the business thanks jason a lot sure. to talk about here but uh, i want to pivot a bit and talk about from law school to entrepreneur to investor so if you could take us back to 1995 um, why did you choose to come to NYU Law and eventually, I know you pursued a JD MBA. Can you tell us a little bit more about at that time, what you were thinking around the terms of your career path and then sure. talk to us a little bit about what you did after graduation. Okay. So, um, I, uh, w was born in Wappingers Falls, New York. I lived in Queens, um, growing up, I moved around a lot. And then when I was 11, I moved actually into Greenwich Village um, and lived in the village for a year and a half. And it was actually a period of time where that was not a desirable thing. Believe me, that that existed. Um, um, and so uh, I, I had sort of a fondness for the New York area. I ended up moving to Florida, then went to University of Maryland and, and studied finance and started a business in college selling jewelry door to door to fraternities and sororities and got a cease and desist letter and basically did some research on that with the student legal aid office and found out that the party that was telling me that I couldn't do something was like legally allowed to tell me that, which I just kind of blew my mind. And I decided that I wanted to be the person sending that letter next time, not the one receiving it. So I sort of decided on, on law school. And I would say that I decided on law school, but it's a little bit of revisionist history. I also think that I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I, I wanted to start a business and be involved in, in business creation. I came from uh, a, a single mom home and my mom had a jewelry business and it struggled. And, um, and, but I just love the passion and, and the people that I would interact with from my, my aunt was involved in the company and, and it never became a, you know, it was barely enough to, to, to kind of keep food on the table, so to speak, but um, it just created a, a, a very passionate part of 
for me in my heart of that early stage and, and, and small business creation. Um, and so I had that in the back of my mind. I was graduating. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I got the cease and desist letter and I thought, you know what, I can go to law school, I can learn and I can delay what I'm going to do for the next three years. Um, and then I ended up going to NYU for uh, NYU law school. And then I decided, you know what, I don't really have any idea what I'm going to do. So I'm going to delay for another year. And I did a JD MBA. And um, while I was in law school, actually immediately behind where your, I think Zoom screensaver is, I don't think you're actually there, but in the courtyard, um, we were lined up getting lockers on the first day of law school. And everyone was talking, you know, we all first day there wait, waiting to, to figure out, meet, meet new people or what have you. And my area started talking about what, what, what brought you to law school and what kind of law do you want to practice? And everyone seemed to have a really good answer. I want to be a corporate lawyer. And a lot of people had had a lot of experience before then. I, I came pretty much right from college. And, uh, and I said that I didn't want to um, be a lawyer or practice law. I wanted to start a business. And like four people said, well, why are you here at law school then? Why didn't you just go start a business? Again, it was 1995, sort of early stages of the internet. And one of my classmates overheard that and came over to me and said, you know, I also want to start a business one day. And we became kind of best friends uh, in that. And then had one or two other of our other friends who also became kind of best friends. And we used to brainstorm different business ideas all the time. And we took a couple of classes together to write business plans along the lines of the competition that you mentioned. And, uh, and really kind of immer immersed ourselves in this entrepreneurial ecosystem at NYU, which was, which was quite easy to find. You know, it's in the middle of New York. And so um, it is easy to find people that are very entrepreneurial minded. And so uh, anyway, that was kind of the, the, the catalyst to get me to, uh, to NYU. I think that in terms of like, why did I choose NYU? Um, I chose NYU. One is because, I mean, I'm certainly biased, but it's it's the best law school in the world. I mean, it it's like you're in the middle of New York, um, you're in Greenwich Village. The faculty is incredible. The caliber of students is extraordinary. Um, there's so much to do. The opportunities, whether it's finance, uh, technology, media, fashion, like you name it, New York is the, the the hub of that. And so the opportunity to kind of be a part of that was really exciting for me. So anyway, when I got to school, I was sort of like really energized. And I'd also, there was this book, The Insider's Guide to Law Firms. And it, and it had talked about what the culture is of this law school and this law school, et cetera. And NYU was always ranked as like the most collaborative law school. And that's kind of much more aligned with my value set and, and, and th than some of the other schools where um, they might've been um, they might have taken a sort of different cultural approach to, to, to education. And so for me, it was kind of a, I, I remember having gotten a, a bunch of other admissions letters, and then I kept just hoping and hoping and hoping that, uh, that NYU's, I would get a letter from NYU, I kept checking my mailbox, and then I remember checking my mailbox, and then as soon as the NYU letter came in, I didn't check my mailbox for any of the other schools, even though I had applied to a bunch of other sort of like top, top schools. And, uh, and NYU is kind of like the, the perfect match I knew for me. And it actually turned out even better than I'd expected. Um, my experience there was great. And, and the friends that I've made are my best friends today. So uh, it's been great. Um, so anyway, long-winded answer, but that was kind of like what brought me to NYU. And what, what I thought about when I was in law school was, how can I start a company? How can I use this, this law school experience to start a business? And just one, one thing on that, which is when I had done the JD MBA, um, I started interviewing for, uh, during early interview week, I, I did, uh, interviewed with a bunch of investment banks and had a number of offers at, at, at banks and other sort of finance related companies. And I, I met with one of my professors who basically said, look, you learn a methodology of thinking in law school, but you don't actually learn the law. And so you come to law school. Why don't you apply that for a year or two to really kind of create differentiation between you and other people in, in the workforce and it really resonated with me. And so I ended up deciding that I would go to law, to a law firm instead of going to something in finance. And then when I got there, I really wanted to do something entrepreneurial. So um, what I used to do is I used to walk around the office and take people's dinner order 
and put it on my credit card so that I could get 2% cash back. And I did that from uh, really August through October. And then I was on the phone with, with one, with, with my law school classmate who, uh, who he and I were, you know, were starting to brainstorm different business ideas. And I called up and we started talking about that and that experience at my firm and at his firm, he had an older brother who had been at, at practicing law for a number of years as well. And sort of, we all talked about our shared experiences and out of that, the idea for Seamless was really born um, where it was, how can we first enable individuals to order? Then it morphed into how can we get businesses that pay for food to order, use our, use our platform. And as part of the ordering process, people, all of the menus of area restaurants would be posted online. You would know the hours of the restaurants. So you'd know who's open. You'd know who would be delivering to your area. Um, and if you worked at a firm, you would know what client matter numbers are able to be to receive what amounts of allocation. So if you're a partner, you have a budget of X. If you're an associate, you have a budget of Y, et cetera. And uh, we, we implemented that as kind of the, that was our, our thought of how the system would work. And we launched that again, it, you know, raised 345,000 bucks and, and, uh, and away we went. Jason, first, can I just say thank you? Because uh, if it weren't for food tech delivery, I don't know how I would have survived this pandemic. So thank you so much. Well, the thanks are all to you. <laughs> thank you for, for, for eating. Please keep eating. We um, will. I mean, uh, so, you know, very, very grateful for delivery. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Jason, a few things. One um, is that a number of students who graduate follow that path, right? They go to a law firm or they practice law in a public interest setting or in another space. And at those in those roles and at those organizations, they may find themselves wanting to do something entrepreneurial. Uh, I love what you just shared, right? You, you figured out a way to, you, you started doing the, the dinner orders and built something around that eventually. But generally, is there a framework for somebody who may be struggling through, to think through, how do I, how do I find the time? I'm, I'm really inundated. Firm life is incredibly busy. I'm being drained in so many different ways. What advice or strategies would you share with a person who may find themselves in that situation? Sure. Uh, so I, I have a, a mindset that um, is really that like everyone is the CEO of a company already, whether they know it or not. And it's like the company of you. Um, and I, I, I used to talk about this when I was running businesses where regardless of what your role is in the company, if you do a really effective job um, in, in that role or in that company, then that's going to have a big impact on the broader organization. And I think that, that sort of applying that to everyone being the business of themselves or like everyone is the CEO of your own business, then I think that it kind of takes a little bit of the pressure off of trying to find another idea because kind of the idea is inside of you. And so what I mean by that is Goldman Sachs didn't invent investment banking. They just figured out a way to do it extremely well. And Apple didn't invent, you know, the, the, the electronics. They, they just figured out a way to really do it extraordinarily well. And like you can go through uh, in, in like every industry leader, right? Battery technology existed far before Tesla. People were thinking about self-driving cars far before Tesla. And I think that really one of the things that people um, underestimate is how differentiating it is to just do what you are going to say you're going to do. So to be one of the best attorneys, yes, you need to have a subject matter understanding, but you need to also be responsive to your clients. And you would be shocked at how often, even today, I'll be working with a new attorney and they say, oh, I'll get you such and such on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, I get an email. Oh, I'm sorry. I was running a little bit behind, et cetera. You'll have it on Friday. And in my mind, it's like, at the very least, I should have gotten that email on Wednesday morning, knowing that at least in anticipation of, of the deadline that wasn't going to be met. So this is somewhat sort of like of a, of a non-responsive preamble to, to answering the question. But I really think that a lot of it has to do with um, whatever someone does, I think that if you just figure out like, how can I do what I'm doing to the very best of my abilities? 
And, and then I think that once people do that, then they look, start looking around and saying, well, what is not being done? What could I do better in the world that is out there? Like, what are the things that are problems that I think I could solve? And then you start thinking about how can I solve those? And, and I think that, you know, if, if one can orient their, his or her perspective to, to not looking at problems as being sort of like insurmountable, but like, Every problem has some potential solution and figuring out what that will look like. And I think that a lot of times people get really mired in the, the getting started, which I think is like 80% of the problem. Um, and, and so I had, uh, when, I, when I ended up leaving Seamless, I met with a friend of mine who uh, ran a very large private equity fund. And he said to me, Jason, I have one thought for you. And he said, if you wanna start another business, there's two ways that you can do it. Number one is you can, and he stood up from his chair. He was in my office. He stood up from his chair. He went over to the office, my office door. He shut the door. He turned the lights off. He sat in his chair. He said, do me a favor, close your eyes. I closed my eyes and he said, okay. He said, just think about a new business. He's like, did anything come to you? Did anything come to you? And after like, you know, 30 seconds, obviously nothing had come to me. And uh, then he stood up, turned the lights back on. And he said, okay, so that's method one. He said, or method two is get up and get out there and get involved in other things that you're passionate about. And so I can tell you that I have a friend who started a business where he believed that social media was going to be a very big deal before many other people did. Um, there had been Friendster and, 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 and MySpace, et cetera, but it really hadn't kind of like fully caught mainstream. So in any of he believed that social media marketing would be a quite valuable industry and sector. And what he ended up doing was he set up a meeting with, I'm gonna make it up and say, the CMO of Coca-Cola. Um, and he basically said, I have an idea that's gonna revolutionize social media marketing for you, et cetera. Please bring your whole marketing team. And he had this really big meeting with this very senior executive and he basically said, you tell me about your social media strategy, and then I will share with you what I think you can do to improve and, and what I would recommend. So they shared their whole super, uh, social media strategy. He took copious notes on that. And he said, you know what? I think you're actually doing everything really well. I don't have a whole lot of value to add. And then he set up meeting number two. And he said, tell me about your social media strategy. And they told him, and then he said, oh, and I have a couple of other ideas that you might want to consider. And he just borrowed the ideas from meeting number one. And he did that 10 times, but by the 10th meeting, he knew more about social media marketing than any one of those other people. He became an expert in that. And then he built a suite of tools to enable companies to do social media marketing. He sort of met with the, prob the people that had the problem, et cetera. And so I think that's so much of what stops people from starting a business is this idea of like, there's an area there, but I don't really know that much about it. Or I don't even really know exactly how to get started. Or maybe you graduate from law school and you say like, okay, I know if this should be a C corporation or an S corporation or an LLC or what have you, but like, then what's the next step? And I think one of the things that people ought to do is most of the people, if not every one of the people at NYU is just like, you know, it's a very smart group of people. And just as an aside, I remember um, having graduated with a degree in finance, and this is no in any way attempt to disparage people uh, uh, with, from, from the business side of the house, so to speak. But I remember sitting in law school periods of time where someone would be called on and they would they'd be on call all day and the teacher would ask a question and they would answer it in a way that you could have sit, I could have sit in that, in that classroom for like 20 years thinking about the problem. And they would, I would have never come up with the creative solution that they, that they had just suggested, which was like, unfortunately, or fortunately, a very common thing as, as I'm sure the class, the students at NYU know, like just the caliber of, of talent, of talent that's around them. But I think that one of the things that people, um, that, that, that people who are sort of in, from an IQ standpoint, very intelligent, um, is that there's kind of this inverse correlation between intelligence and risk tolerance. 
right? Like when you're not, like, uh, there was a, a, a man who I think in the 80s robbed a bank. Uh, he bought, robbed a series of banks It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. So this man robbed a bank and uh, he'd robbed like 10 banks, never been caught. And then the 11th bank, and I'm making the numbers up, so don't hold me to this exactly, but, um, but robs the 11th bank and gets arrested. And in the interrogation, the, po the police are saying, well, like, why did you do this? And he said, I have a question for you. How did you find me? And they said, well, sir, you weren't wearing a mask. In all of the other times you robbed the bank, you were wearing a mask. This time you weren't wearing a mask. And well, he said, I know I, I wasn't wearing a mask, but I, I had sprayed lime, uh, lemon juice all over my face. And they said, lemon juice? And he said, yeah, you know, it's the base for invisible ink. And so no one could see my face. So they ended up having kind of psyche eval come in and they recognized that like intellectually he was not fully there um, and he had a very low IQ. And what they, they, they started doing tests, robbing a bank is like the riskiest behavior. You go in, you're one person, there's probably more people that have weapons than you. There's alarms, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. And then you physically are leaving with something. So you have to also figure out how to get, get away. Like it's the probability of a successful bank robbery is like, incredibly low right um but but people do it and off and, and so in any event what they identified was that this particular individual had very low iq and wasn't really able to assess the risk appropriately and so people often overestimate their intelligence and they often overestimate the probability of of failure when they're thinking you know when they're thinking about it it's the, the old adage of like how is it that 80 percent of people would rate themselves as being better looking than average, right? Like by definition, that's not that's not not, not the case. So so um, but but I think that like these inherent biases, especially when people are very smart, they start to overthink how uh, how likely they are to fail, and they don't even get started. And I think that like that is the biggest failure in my mind. And I can't tell you the number of people that have come up to me through the years and said. Oh, I had the idea for Seamless in 1992 when I was working at a law firm or when I was working at a bank or what have you. And I, I kind of look and say, the only difference between that person and, and me and, and, and my partners was that we started it and they didn't. And we didn't overthink it. And did we think that there were all these risks? Sure. Like we, I mean, while it sounds crazy now, um, people didn't have high speed. The, the reason that we started focusing on businesses is people didn't have high speed internet access at their homes. They were all on dial up connection and only a fraction of people actually had internet connectivity at their homes. So you can imagine restaurants, which are not generally technologically sophisticated, what educating them on, on the internet was, was about and how to receive orders electronically. And, and that, that entire framework was really challenging and it was really educating people in a process of, this is what it means to add an item to your cart. I mean, now it's kind of like, of course, everyone knew that it's second nature and now people do for sure, but people didn't. The internet was very new, using it for commerce was very new. And so I would just say that like, there were countless reasons that our business should have failed. But the, I think the reason that it didn't is because we really try to sort of codify, okay, what are the risks? And then what can we do to mitigate those risks and just not focus on the 50 risks, but like, let's solve issue number one and then let's solve issue number two and let's solve issue number three. And when you sort of break it down, you know, the, the, the adage of the longest journey starts with a single step. I think that the idea of starting a business is much, is much lower. And I also think there was a great graduation speech um, by uh, Admiral McRaven at University of Texas. And he talks about, the 10 things or eight, eight things that people should do. But the first thing is sort of start by making your bed every day. And if you make your bed, then it, it creates a proactive mindset. You, you wake up and you have something and you do it. And then you go and that hopefully will compound and carry on through the day. And then at the end of the day, if you had a lousy day, well, worst case is that you come home and your bed is made. And so maybe tomorrow will be better. Um, but I think that it's the same sort of thing with starting a business of, the idea of starting a business, recruiting talent, raising money, all of these things, it is complicated. And there are a lot of steps that one needs to, to take. So one is break those things down into smaller steps. And once you do the first step, then the second step becomes more natural and the third step becomes more natural. And then the other thing is 
Um, one thing that I have found is that very intelligent people often underestimate the value of mentorship because throughout their lives, they've been, they've, they've been the ones with the answer. And the reality is, is that a lot of things in business are sort of intuitive, sort of experiential, but you don't, people say like, oh, well, this was intuitive. You develop intuition over time. And so I think that one of the things that people should really think about is how can people develop mentorship? Thinking about the professors at NYU or the business school or wherever that may be, um, these are people that have kind of dedicated time to helping to educate you and, and the opportunity to kind of leverage those people and ten, decades of experience is really a unique opportunity. You know, one of the things that's amazing that most students overlook is that when you are a student, you can talk with almost anyone, right? Like there is almost no NYU alum that if you say, hi, I work, I, I am a student at NYU Law School and I've been doing a report on your company and I would love five minutes of your time and I'm not asking you for a job. Like 98% of people will find that five minutes and maybe not immediately, but at some point in time, or they'll get you to the right people. And so I just think that being a student is a really unique time in one's life to be able to take advantage of that. And a lot of times people, people don't. But I, I think that um, people put so much pressure on themselves to come up with a great idea. And I just keep going back to Goldman didn't invent banking. They just do it really well. Find something and do it well. And you'll be amazed at how differentiating that is and how that compounds upon itself. And then you have great talent wants to work with you and then they have great ideas and you keep building upon that. I actually just gave a presentation to a company um, that's been growing very rapidly. And one of the things that they've been thinking a lot about is how do you make everyone feel like a part of the company, right? Someone came in in the very earliest days and now the company's got 500 people. And so how do you keep that person uh, that's the 500th employee feeling like it's their company as well? And I think that I, re I really believe that a company is refounded every day, right? Like every single time it's, I have, I have three kids. My family was not complete until my, my third son, you know, my third child um, uh, was born. And so, so I think that like that mindset of constantly trying to reinvent yourself, taking advantage of by, by finding opportunities and becoming a subject matter expert, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, partnering with faculty, getting to know other students, your network at law schools also, like if you're gonna come and you're gonna just focus on your academics, you're missing a great part of NYU. It's really all about your, your peers. That's terrific, Jason, thank you. I know we had a question in this area and you addressed it already. So I'm gonna pick up another question that comes from Juan. It's very specific, so we'll, we'll start there, but perhaps we could go broader. Um, the specific question, Juan's asking is your tax highlights seem interesting and make sense. How did you handle the 83B election and FME? And maybe the broader question I wanna pose to you, Jason, is how do you use that law school toolkit to be successful as an entrepreneur and then as an investor? Sure, uh, loaded question. And, and uh, I think that the, the, the honest answer is like, it's, it's different for everyone. And I think that one of the things that, that is a critical life skill is to be intellectually honest with yourself and figure out what it is that you do really well and what it is that you don't do really well. And then figure out how you can surround yourself with talent that can do the things that you don't do very well. And that one plus one equals three type synergy is, in my opinion, how businesses really get created. And I think that that doesn't necessarily need to be a founder. That can be, uh, that can be any, anyone on the team. And I'll, I'll just say that I, I was on a panel at a prominent venture fund that um, had four angel investors that have been doing uh, you know, individual private investing. And then they had 10 founders that had just sold their company. And the four people were, were talking about how, what methodology they use to, uh, to determine whether to invest in a business. And I was the fourth 
person just it, it just worked out that way. We were going going sort of from one end to the other. And the first person talked about how they have a SaaS framework that they use and they focus on this multiple band and they have this background and experience in venture. So they know and they were sort of very technical. And then the second person came on and they had a quasi similar answer where they said that this is my background and I was in information security. And so I really try to stick with my knitting, et cetera, et cetera. And in any event, when, when it got to me, I said that my lens of investing is really the exact same lens that I use when I was building a business. And that is that there are some times that I meet people and I just think to, I, I, you can feel their energy, their wisdom, their experience, their, 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 just, um, their, their command of an area. And in my, like for me, I just want to be around those people. I want to learn from those people. I want to feel their energy. I want to uh, understand what they understand. I want to think about the world and look at the world from the perspective that they they look at the world. And and I think that like regardless of whether I was hiring someone at a company that I've been involved with or as an investor thinking about investing in in, in businesses, for me it really is: Do I want to spend some of my life with this person, do I think that I can learn and do I think I can also help them? And, and so I think that, that for me, that kind of, I don't know if this is exactly responsive to, to the question, but I think that like, for me, that is really where everyone should be spending their time and, 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 and focusing. And I think that, that sort of to, to pull it back to the original question, I think being in law school or, or really at any time in one's life, being truly intellectually honest with what are the things that, that you are very passionate about that you would do if you were not gonna be paid any money, that the, it, the reward is gonna be the actual work. Um, you know, I, I had someone that I worked with who, uh, who basically um, told me that the reason that she was resigning was because she sees the passion that I bring to work every day and just doesn't have the same passion for her role. And, and she said to me, like, are you upset? And I was like, no, I'm super proud because I really believe that everyone should have that or aspire to have that with what they're doing. You know, life is short. And, and uh, to, to be able to if, if there's an area that you're excited about that you can work with incredible people and generally people are spending more time with their colleague, their coworkers than they are with anyone else. Like if you can work with great people, building something that's impactful, that really means something to you, that's kind of like the Holy grail. And then all of the other spoils really are derived from that. So I think that when you, when you talk about um, law school, like, Part of it was just thinking about what are the classes that I did well in and which ones did I not do well in and why? And, and part, you know, it, it was a lot just where I was focusing my time and energy. Like, what was it about this class versus this other class that I really enjoy doing? And, and I think this sort of like going back to this methodology of thinking about problems and prob pro problem solving, thinking about precedent, right? Like people talk about, uh, venture capital is all about pattern recognition. That is what people are taught about in law school in different contexts. It's like, how can you use this precedent and apply it in a different context? And how can you extend it? And how can you take the characteristic of company A and company B and apply it to a completely new industry? I'm like, all of those things that are really skills that people are learning and refining in law school, I think are very applicable um, to, to the real world. Thanks, Jason. I know we have time for a few more questions here, so we'll try to get through them. One is about sure. experience for students during law school. Somebody's asking, do you recommend pursuing summer associate roles or focusing on getting startup entrepreneurial experience instead while they're at law school? Uh, so I think that my answer is, is, is somewhat dependent upon whether or not someone has had prior professional work experience. Um, this may be sort of like a uh, uh, counter to what a lot of people would, would, would think. You know, there's this adage of the best addiction to overcome is the addiction to a paycheck. 
Um, but I, I'm actually of the perspective that having some, uh, some, what I'll call like legitimate professional experience is incredibly valuable. Um, and I think that, that whether it's a summer associate role or, or really kind of whatever it is, so long as it's what I would call like a real job where you're taking it seriously, you're hoping to get an offer for full-time post the summer, et cetera. Um, I think that, that having that experience is quite valuable. I can tell you that like I matured late. I went to, uh, I went to law school to basically directly from college. I, I tutored LSAT and GMAT for six months in between because I graduated from, in December and then in, in, in September I, or whenever, uh, August maybe, um, school started. And in between that, I, I did some traveling. And so like, I didn't really ever, I didn't really worked in an office in a professional context. You know, in college, I was landscaping and, and working as a temp um, 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 and, and, and moving from job to job to job. And so, um, so I, I didn't really have that ex same experience. Um, so, so I think that if someone doesn't have that experience, I think that uh, going and working at a summer associate job is is great. And one thing that I would tell you is that um, most I, I worked at a law firm. Um, I went I went and I, I started in September. We came up with the concept in or maybe it was August. Came up with the concept in October. I left in February. And when I tell you that one of the things that I did was I spent do hundreds of hours reading the business plans of clients of the firm. I was just I'd never seen that before, right? Like I'd been in business plan competitions, but it's different when it's like, wow, this company raised $40 million or this company has 600 people and you get to read the business plans. And so I think that like, um, if you look at being a summer associate or what have you as like a PhD experience, right? Like you're being paid to learn, to learn about what areas are interesting to you. And so if you go into, the, 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 the file system and you see that you're not interested at all in the cryptocurrency businesses, but you're interested solely in the solar and like what, whatever, what you, you'll, you'll sort of like be very, be very aware of what it is that excites you. And I think that um, if people do that and they do that effectively, then, then they can make the best out of any job and whether it is some or summer associate, doesn't doesn't really matter. There's a uh, an investment that I have in a company named Clio, which is practice management software for attorneys. And uh, the company's doing super well. Started by an attorney, and he took his experience there. I will tell you that if uh, I hadn't gone to my firm, that I wouldn't have started Seamus because I wouldn't have known about this overtime meal issue that ultimately morphed into a whole you know a whole category. And so I think that. If you, it doesn't really matter what you do. It matters the mindset that you bring to it. And if you bring a, a kind of like, not, not the growth mindset that it's not a comment on like the, the Carol Dwick, uh, uh, um, um, uh, approach, but, but, uh, but really more of just like bring the mindset of, of what is it like, what am I interested in naturally? What are the areas that I'm excited about? What what uh, what am I willing to stay until two o'clock in the morning at the firm doing, other than whatever the legal documents w would be? Um, you know, I, I would tell you that I I I practiced for five months, a uh, very short period of time, and quite honestly, as the person that I was working for would probably tell you, for three of those months that I was writing a business plan for Seamless, like my work product pro probably wasn't as spectacular as I might have liked at the time, you know, if I was choosing to, to stay in the, in the law firm path, um, though he did invest in Seamless. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but, but, uh, but I can tell you that like, I really enjoyed the experience that I had. And one thing that I think law firms really provide is a very broad purview of really interesting businesses that are large and small. Obviously it depends upon what your, what matters you're working on. But if you're working in the litigation department, like really understanding the nuances of understanding a contract that comes up all the time, figuring out leverage points in relationships and situations. What are the various parties incentives? So like, I think that no matter what people do, there are huge lessons that you can learn from being a summer associate, from being an intern at, at various other things. 
I will t also tell you that um, that it is differentiating, right? Like there are a lot of people that now go to work at startups, but if you go and you work at a law firm, then like you're 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 perceived, even if it's four months or uh, four weeks or eight weeks, depending upon if you do a full summer or half summer or what have you. Um, um, there there is a perception in the market that you have a specialized knowledge that can be very differentiating. That could be the difference. So anyway, I, I, it's it's so hard to say should someone go to work as a summer associate or not. I really think that you should do what what you are what is most exciting to you. But what I would tell you is that whatever you do, go and try to be not the best summer associate. Go and try to be the best summer associate that you can be. Right. It's not about whether you're better than this other person. There's always someone better, smarter, faster, richer, stronger, et cetera. Like I think that so much of 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 entrepreneurship is being comfortable with yourself, because I can guarantee you that you will face countless rejections and you will constantly be forced to doubt whether the thing that you are working on is something that's worthy of your time and your team's time. And I think sort of building that in, internal resolve of, of, of relying upon your own in, internal compass versus an external compass is going to be kind of like the most valuable skill that, that one, can, uh, that one can, can develop. Thank you, Jason. We have time for one final question. What is the most important thing you've learned as an investor navigating the pandemic over the past year? Uh, it's a great question. Um, uh, this is not the right answer, but I would just say that, like, if 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 your kind of like own internal, your family, whatever those things are, like, if your basic infrastructure has instability, um, that should be the biggest priority over everything else, right? It's kind of like. If you don't have your health, and it, this has forced everyone to rethink, regardless of age or or situation, like like what is their situation, and how can you make sure that you're sort of protected and your family's protected, et cetera. So that's just as a somewhat throwaway comment. I think that that um, the the biggest learn the two biggest learnings for me, one is how little I actually know, how significant these massive things can the, the impact that they can have on society on a more micro level on a business, right? I have one friend who's involved in, an, in a company where revenue is down 93% year over year. And I have another friend whose business was up 400% in the first quarter and neither one of them prepared for it. It's just, that's what happened. And so, you know, I think part of it is just really remembering that as an investor, luck plays a huge role in, in things. Timing plays a huge role in things. And so when the balls don't bounce your way, just remember to not take it too personally. Um, I think so that's kind of like number one. I think number two is that macro trends really do matter. That, that um, when there are exogenous event, uh, events, that th they generally will accelerate something that is already in process versus change that. Um, that could be alternatives to currency and cryptocurrency. That could be in e-commerce. That could be in a migration to the cloud. Like whatever those trends were, right? Focuses on health, healthcare, uh, aging population. Like all of these trends that have been underway for quite some time. Like all of the macro demographic trends really just were accelerated. And I think that making sure that you've got that macro trend behind you is 80% of the battle, right? Like if you, if you have a, if you had a okay e-commerce company, you probably have mo much more than okay e-commerce company. Now it's kind of like the rising tide carries all shifts. And I think just like remembering that and remembering so often, and I am definitely prone to this, right? Like I, I am, I think by 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 nature, somewhat contrarian. Um, I like to do things that other people are not doing, and then once everyone's doing them, it becomes le somewhat less interesting for me. And I like to do something else, whether that's been in in you know 
back when I was graduated from law school, everyone wanted to work at a bank, an investment bank or a hedge fund, like everyone. And I wanted to do something that was in the online world, which really the, the internet, had just, the bubble had just burst. Like, like everyone was like, why would you ever want to do that? That was naturally interesting for me. Um, um, focusing on the small and medium sized business world. Again, everyone said like, stay away from that. Like I kind of say to myself, I am definitely not the smartest person in the room. So how can I find fights with people that are not the smartest people in the room, so to speak, right? And so I think that like that self-realization is, is really important. And so I, I think that like go, going back to the, the idea of these macro trends, um, it's, it's um, it, if you are going to spend your time on something, every advantage is valuable. And if you want to, like one of my, I was saying my, my natural proclivities as being contrarian is to try to take a challenged situation and turn it around. Oh, well, I'll come in and I'll fix that. And the thing that I've realized now is that like, I would much rather be involved with a digital business with a macro tailwind than figuring out how to turn in the news, a newspaper around, right? Like, yeah, one might be intellectually stimulating, et cetera, but like, every single day is a battle and you're going, you're walking up a down escalator. And like that just becomes really, really hard over time. Whereas there's nothing that's more sort of like positively reinforcing and endorphin releasing than a success. And, and one of the things that I'm a very big believer of is like compounding. We think about it as like a finance term, but it's a life term. The relationships that you create, those compound over time problems left unaddressed compound over time. And I think the same thing with investing in just business creation, it's like the trends compounded over time are going to be the biggest ally for you as an entrepreneur, for you as an investor, the same thing in a company where you're getting some traction, you hire great people, then they are, attract other great people and so on and so forth. Jason, this hour has gone by way too quickly and we have more questions to get to. So it just means we'll need to have you come back. I just want to say thank you, Jason. I first met My you pleasure. in 2011 and what you said earlier is so true. Every time I've spent any time with you, it's clear that you're incredibly passionate and conversations with you are always life-giving. So thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. We're so thrilled to have spent this time with you. And of course, thanks to all who have attended today as well. Uh, this will be posted online in a few weeks. Uh, so feel free to share when that goes live on YouTube. And Jason, thank you again for your time. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Good luck, Take everyone. Care, Great to thanks meet so you. Much. Take thank care. You. Bye. 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 Bye.